iPads, your devices, your phones, whatever you have. Go with me to 2 Kings chapter 4. 2 Kings chapter 4. Um, 2 Kings chapter 4. When you have it, say amen. We're going to start there with a reading at the 8th verse of 2 Kings chapter 4. I always covet your prayers because I'm, uh, I'm a preacher who knows where my strength and help comes from. Uh, I, I've watched people stand up and want to stand up on their own, not working. But if you have God's power behind you, God will get his point across. Are you with me? Now, I'm, I'm looking here because I don't want to read all of this, so I'm going to be, just kind of follow me. I'm going to read enough that we can make sense of the text since I'm going to preach through the text. You'll pick it up as we go. This is a very powerful story. And sometimes we miss what the Holy Spirit is trying to say to us in this text. Uh, a lot of times it's a good Mother's Day text. I, I like that. But there is much more to this text than just Mother's Day. All right, verse 8. I'm reading from a New International Version. One day Elisha went to Shunem. And a well-to-do woman was there who urged him to stay for a meal. So whenever he came by, he stopped there to eat. She said to her husband, I know that this man who comes our way is a holy man of God. Let's make a small room on the roof and put, it, put a bed in it and a table and a chair and a lamp for him. Then he can stay there whenever he comes to us. One day when Elisha came and went up to the room and laid down, he said to his servant Gehazi, Call this humanite. So he called her and she stood before him. Elisha said to him, Tell her, You have gone, you have done all of this or gone through all this trouble for us. Now what can be done for you? Can we speak on your behalf to the king, to our commander, to the army? She replied, I have a home among my own people. What can be done for her? Elisha asked. Gehazi said, she has no son and her husband is old. Then Elisha said, call her. So he called her. She stood in the doorway. About this time next year, Elisha said, you will hold a son in your arms. You know what? I'm going to keep reading. Follow me through the story. I'm sorry. But, and she said, no, my Lord, she objected. Please, man of God, don't mislead your servant. But the woman became pregnant. And the next year, about the same time, she gave birth to a son, just as Elisha had told her. The child grew. One day he went out with his father, who was with the reapers. He said to her, to his father, my head, my head. His father told the servant, carry him to, your, to his mother. After the servant had lifted him up and carried him to his mother, the boy sat on her lap until noon, and there he died. She went up, laid him on the bed, and the man of God then shut the door and went out. She called to her husband and said, Please send me one of the servants and a donkey so I can go to the man of God quickly and return. Why go to him today, he asked. It's not a new moon or a Sabbath. That's all right, she said. She saddled the donkey, said to the servant, Lead on, don't slow down. For me, unless I tell you to. So she set out and came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. That's enough right there. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for the word this morning. Let the word seek into someone's spirit. Let them get blessed by what's said, Lord, and make sure that there is an understanding that's quickened by the Holy Spirit and not by me. Move me out of the way and allow your spirit to take presence. We're going to speak for as long as the Spirit of the Lord will allow from this thought. Oh no, it's on. Let me give you another emphasis. Oh no, it is on. I want you to hear, oh no, it's on. Uh, Jennifer Lopez, better known as J-Lo or Jenny from the Block, as also mirrored in her hit song. She started out her show business career as a dancer on the acclaimed show In Living Colors. But she went on from there to become a versatile superstar. Uh, Jennifer is a dancer. Uh, she is a fashion designer. She is a uh, choreographer. 
She is a actor. She is a rapper. She is a singer. And one of her breakout lead roles was the movie Enough. I don't know if you ever saw that movie, but I love that movie. It's about this woman who was a waitress, and she married what she thought was her Prince Charming. And when she married him, she found out too late after having a child. Uh, that's a, a repeated theme that we can go into when we don't, you know, measure who we marry by God. She found out too late that he was an abuser. And so he began to beat her physically. He began to abuse her mentally and emotionally and torment her and even threaten to kill their child. Well, she started in a cycle. First she said, I'm going to take it. Then she said, no, um, I'm not going to take it. I'm going to run away. So she tried running away. Then she tried the police and restraining orders. And then after that, he would always find her. Then she ran away and changed her name and got a new identity. And he was still able to find her. And then finally, this last time when he went to get her, I want you to see the scene. It was such a rude thing. He beat her. He kicked her. And he punched her. And she was laying there in a pool of blood. And she looked up. And after he walked out of the room, glaring at her in a very nasty way, you could see her head lift up and she just said, enough. I want you to think about that. She said, enough. And in saying enough, she was saying, this is going long enough. It's on. And when she got up off that floor, you could tell she was running away, but she wasn't running away in fear. She was running to get prepared for the battle. She was preparing herself for a fight. She was preparing herself not to live the way she was. She was preparing herself to get out of the hole she had dug in her life. I hope somebody here hears a theme in that, that you don't have to stay in the hole that you've dug in your life. You don't have to stay in bondage. When you get to the point that you've had enough, when you get to where Jennifer was, because the message God wants me to relate to you this morning is a powerful one. It's one where you got to get to the point where you're saying, I'm not going to stay here and just take it. I'm not going to lay here and be kicked around. I'm not going to let people. I'm not going to let the devil. I'm not going to let life just punch me as a punching bag and I don't get the things I need from God. You got to tell yourself, you got to get to the point that you're going to fight for what's yours. And that's when you stand up and say, it is on. Oh, no, I had enough. Somebody ought to get a new response today. You ought to get a new response out of you that says, I will not lay here and take it. It is on. That's what's important. That's so powerful about the text because in the showdown scene of the movie, when she finally got the best of her husband, um, she couldn't bring herself to kill him. And then all of a sudden, he raised up from behind her. You ever been watch, watching the movies and you see... When they finally get Freddy down or whoever the monster is, they, they, they let him live. I don't know about you, but I would have done something about that. But Because they always rise back up. And sure enough, he came up behind her, and she had to turn around and give the lethal blow. Watch this. You have no choice. I'm going somewhere. I wanted to tell you, you can listen to me for fun. You can read the scripture. You can try to turn me off. But I'm telling you today, you don't have a choice. You're going to have to learn how to get in there and fight because it is on. You're, you know what? Sometimes people don't realize the battle's already going on. You're in it, and you act like you're going to stay back there on nonsense and not and get beat up. You don't have to. Today, I want to take you on a journey with this Shunammite woman. I want to take you so you can see that I just got to build inside of me that spirit that says, that new response that says, it's on. Uh, 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 you want to attack me? You attack the wrong person. You, you think I'm going to keep laying down? You got the wrong person. You think I'm not going to fight back? I have had enough. You know what? Too many of us out there. Live by that old adage, you know, you can't teach a new, uh, oh, uh, what house say, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. I need you to know something. I'm not, I don't believe that's true in the Lord, but I'm not talking about just spiritual warfare. Because we know spiritual warfare. And spiritual warfare, uh, scriptures like Ephesians 6 and 12, that says, um, uh, wherefore, no, it says, uh, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, 
against the rules of darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. I know spiritual warfare. Or we know uh, the scripture that Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 6 and 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Wherefore you have professed and been a witness in front of so many people. What I'm saying is, I'm not talking about that. I'm saying you know how to fight. You know it's spiritual warfare, but you got to change your attitude. Now, let me say that statement again. Many of us got that statement is, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Or here's how we say it. I'm too old to change now. But this is just the way I am. I'm telling you that's killing you, and that's not how it is in God. In God, there's always a chance to be restored. How many know that? In God, there's always a chance to be renewed. I, I want to let that marinate. There's always a chance for you to be restrengthened. I'm telling somebody, God is looking for a way to restrengthen you and build you back up again. What I'm telling you, you're never in bondage to old addictions, old habits, or old defeats. Don't let the fact that you failed before keep you failing now. Because you failed before with what you've learned from God. And where you are in God now, how many know I'm strong enough now to be able to handle what I couldn't handle before? Let's look at some Bible. You know, I like, I like us to see what God is saying. The first thing is you don't have to be in, 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 in bondage to old addictions and defeats. How do I know that? Listen to Pastor Paul in Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. Uh, Paul is saying... Um, that it's not as if I have apprehended. Brethren, I don't count myself as apprehended. This one thing I do, I forget the things behind. Don't just stop there. I reach forth for the things ahead. In God, there's always a future. And I press toward the mark of the high calling in Christ Jesus. Did you hear it? I'm never in bondage because I can always forget what's behind me, reach forward for what's in front of me, and press on. Tell somebody, press. Somebody holler with me. I got to press because I always have a future. The Holy Spirit just spoke something to me right here. Somebody out there needs to realize you have a future. As messed up, jacked up, as life has been, you still have a future future in God. So you're never in bondage. So not only that, we have witnesses. I always like the fact that if somebody else can make it, I know I can make it. Get that in your spirit because God is no respecter of persons. But Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 says, Wherefore, seeing we are encompassed about with, encompassed about with so many clouds of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. Come on. And the sin that does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Somebody out there, you need to understand all of us got weights. All of us got sin. But you got to learn how to do what other witnesses did. You got to run this race with patience that is set before us looking unto Jesus. What am I telling you? I got witnesses. I got some folk out there can testify. I was under till I made up my mind. I'm not going to let folk treat me like this. I'm not going to keep my life in a season of punishment when I have a God that's stronger. Oh, I'm helping somebody this morning. Not only are you not in bondages, not only are you not the person, I mean, not only do we have witnesses, here's the best one of all. It's part of our inheritance. That's right. Write this down, please. Write it down. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. I love the fact that it says that we um, stand fast in the liberty wherewith God has set us free. Now watch this. Stand fast, meaning i, I got to stay strong in the liberty. The word liberty means freedom. So it's almost a redundant statement. Here's what God said. Stand fast in your freedom. So I said, I don't feel free, but you are. Because God said, you got to learn how to stand fast in your freedom. He said, stand fast in your freedom, wherefore God has made you free. Be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. What is God saying? Stand fast in your freedom because you realize I've been set free to stay free. Since I am free, I won't let bondages tangle me back up again. 
Same sin, same struggle, same stuff. I'm going to move quickly today into this text. This Shunammite woman is going to teach us, is going to show us what God was saying to us in this text, how she developed this attitude that my deliverance is always rooted and grounded in God's supernatural ability to give me a victory anytime I need it. I'm going to say that again to echo with somebody. God, you have to believe, you have to have the attitude that says, my life is rooted and grounded in God's supernatural ability to give me victory anytime I need it. I want you to write this down as we go through this text. We're going to climb through. What a powerful text. I want you to write this. I, I told you, I always tell you, if you've been listening to me for a while, I will tell you, i like to have a, 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 give you a blueprint of where we're going. So let me tell you where we're going today. First of all, you ha- and I always like to alliterate. You know, most time you'll, you'll find I'm alliterating in my sermons. But if you're going to be the person that says it's on, that develops a new attitude, the first thing you have to constantly remember is keep building your relationship with God. Secondly, you have to keep believing in your reward from God. And thirdly, you have to keep battling till you get results. Let's package that again. You have to keep building your relationship with God. You have to keep believing in your reward. And you have to keep battling until you get results. Where we are today, this is Elijah, S-H-A. He was the protege of Elijah, J-A-H. And Elijah was the one who refused to leave Elijah's side because he wanted to be there when Elijah was taking up in the flame of fire, in a, in a chariot of fire. And if you go to 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 9, you'll find that he asked Elijah, he asked Elijah, yeah, he asked him, he said, give me a double portion of your anointing. And Elijah told him, the only way you're going to get a double portion is if you're there when I'm taken up. I like that. I don't have time to touch it, but I like that. Because sometimes God is saying, the blessing is here, and you have to be there. Some of us lose our concentration, or we lose our ability to hang in there. And isn't this something that we have to think about? Right when we were about to get the blessing, the blessing was gone because we did not hang in there. He said, but you've got to stay. So if you go to that second chapter, you'll find out he tried to get rid of Elijah. But he said, I'm not going anywhere till I get my double portion. And you know what's exciting about his double portion? Is that when you go and look at the Bible, it actually, this is how powerful God is. It actually says that Elijah, with a J, actually did 14 miracles. And Elijah, who we're talking about now, who preached to the divided kingdom, he actually did 28 miracles. Miracles. That's just another example that God does what he says in his word. And here we are with Elijah who first shows up in 2 Kings. And now we go into the miracles that he has done. So the text tells us, our first point is you got to keep building your relationship. It says there happened a day when Elijah was going to Shunem, and there was a woman there who was very great. And when he got through Shunem, it says that the woman decided, she perceived he was a man of God, so she decided to, you know, feed him. Every time he stopped by, he would eat at her place. And not only would he eat at her place every time he stopped by, she said, let's build a little house for him. So they built a room for him off the wall. Can you get the picture? So this woman reached out to God. Here is what happens in building a relationship. He's showing us the first thing for becoming a person that says, I got a new attitude, it's on, is you got to build a relationship with God, which many of us have, but then you got to keep building your relationship with God. Through the ups and the downs, keep building your relationship with God. When things look like they fail, keep building your relationship with God. Can't you see this woman? She didn't have to do anything. She decided I perceive this is a man of God, and I'm going to bring her in. As a matter of fact, I want to tell you the most important thing in your life is your personal relationship with God. Not your pastor's relationship, not your spouse's relationship, not your mother's relationship, not your friend's relationship. Your personal relationship has to do with your personal sin nature. 
See, what I'm saying is you can't go off of my relationship because I don't have the same valleys and mountains and hills that you got. God has given me a relationship with him or the ability to have a relationship with him so I can handle the stuff I got to handle in my life. What are you talking about? None of us have arrived when it comes to handling our sin nature, our fleshly propensities, and our genetic habits. Let me say that again. All of us have a sin nature that we have not controlled. We can't control completely. Don't lie. You can't control your sin nature. Neither do I. That's why it's a constant building of my relationship. All of us have fleshly propensities, meaning there's some things our flesh draws us to that we have to fight to make sure we don't do it. Then there are some genetic habits, some things that were transferred to us. As a matter of fact, I'll go further and tell you, we actually have genetic or we have generational curses, generational, behavioral, and environmental curses that follow us, and that's why our relationship is so important, because if I don't have my relationship with God, I can't break any of those curses out of my life. Oh, I'm helping somebody. You can't break the curse because you got to go deeper and lower than I do. You can't base your life on what somebody else is doing. My relationship may take me praying every day. May take me praying every morning systematically. Your relationship, you may be able to skip a day. I can't skip a day. Anybody like me, I can't skip a day. Because I know without God on my life, I would mess up somewhere along the line. But let's talk about this so you know when I say generational curses, I'm not being spooky. Think about it. Let's, let's put it in a way that you can understand it. Any of us, when we go to the doctor, you know when you go into a doctor and you feel, first thing you got to do is fill out your medical history. But haven't you noticed for surgery, uh, your general practitioner, specialist, all of them, that's why I hate going to a new doctor. You got to fill out all that paperwork, and here's what happens with that paperwork. Eventually, somewhere they're going to ask you about your parents' medical history and your grandparents' medical history. Watch that. You know why they do that? Because they know in the blood. Watch me, y'all. In the blood, it's carried some generational stuff. So genetically, they'll ask you, anybody uh, in your family ever had cancer? Anybody in your family ever had diabetes? Anybody got a weak heart or a bad heart? You know why they ask you that? Because they know that if your grandfather or if your father, they know it can skip a generation. Sometimes we will pick up genetically what we were born into. That's why I'm telling you, you got to have your personal relationship because there are some genetic uh, habits that can be passed down to us. Not only that, we can see this spiritually, not, not just physically and medically. We can see this spiritually where there are times when um, we can watch that um, our behavior or our environment spiritually can be transferred to us. What I mean, if you grew up in an environment where everybody lied, you pick a line. You grew up in an environment where everybody cursed each other out. Tell the truth, you start cursing. You grew up in a house where everybody is mean and nasty to everybody. You turn out to be a mean and nasty person. If everybody's stingy, everybody grabbing the last piece of chicken, you turn out to be a person. I don't care who it is, you're stingy and don't want to share nothing because it's transferred to us behaviorally. Do you know that both Abraham, the father of of nations, Abraham and Isaac, both of them, lie about their wives being their about their wives being their sisters or their wives being their wife out of fear. How is it that Abraham did it and then Isaac did it? Because that behavior was transferred. How come David, when David was the apple of God's eye, the one thing that David messed up with was his adultery with Bathsheba. It set a whole chain of curses in motion. How come when David fell with Bathsheba, how come his son Solomon, who was the wisest man on the earth, he also fell through this chain of adultery? What messed up his heart was the adultery for his other wives. So, first thing we got to understand, build a relationship. you got to continue to build it. And then when we look at, as you understand, we start looking at uh, this woman. Here's, here's how the relationship happens. God is always seeking us so that we can work on his plan. I want you to hear this. God is always seeking us so we can work on his plan. What I mean by that is this woman, watch this, it says that Elisha came through Shunem. Now watch, 
Elisha would come from Carmel to Samaria. To go from Carmel to Samaria, he had to go to Shunem. The text said that he continually went through this area. What am I telling you? Is that when he came through, God was ready to bless this woman because he knew her heart. Watch the text. It says, and this woman perceived who he was, and she decided to reach out and get a place for the man of God. What happens? God is always seeking us to bless us, and in turn, how we get blessed is to seek to do the work of God. If you go back and trace any miracle that happened in the Bible, it's right there in the text, this woman decided that she was going to cook him a meal, that she was going to do, it says there was a great woman there. And the word great is translated as a rich woman, she had money, as a woman of great piety, she loved God. She was a woman of great mercy and great hospitality, and so she used her gifts for God. Oh, I got to stop right there. Some of you don't get blessed because you want a one-sided relationship with God. God is constantly seeking you to bless you, but you never seek Him back to bless Him. When the reality is, He makes the first move, if you would seek back and work for Him, I'm telling you, I know that people's lives have been blessed. People's lives have been blessed and gone on because somewhere along the line, when you sought God, I believe that that's where the extra healing came from. When you sought God, I believe where that's why that night of peace came in. Because somewhere along the line, God was seeking you. Second Chronicles sixteen nineteen says this: The eyes of Second Chronicles sixteen nineteen, the eyes of the Lord go to and fro. Searching for someone he can show himself strong to. God is always seeking us. And when God is seeking us, he's seeking us to bless us. It's right there in the text. When God blesses us, it's because we were trying to do his work. And when God finds somebody that's seeking him, he dwells with that person. You don't believe me? When Zacchaeus, the short man in Scripture, Jesus was coming in town. Zacchaeus, who was a tax collector and, and you know who was a rich man, everybody uh, uh, didn't like. And all of a sudden, he decided, "I want to see Jesus." So Zacchaeus decided to climb a tree. And when he climbed the tree, because of his heart of seeking God, you need to watch this. The Bible says that's where the text came from in Luke, where Jesus said, "The Son of Man." has come to seek and save that which is lost, okay? Which says God came to seek. But look what happened. That night, he looked right up in the tree and said, Zacchaeus, I'm going to be staying in your house tonight. What an awesome passage. So what I'm telling you is, because Zacchaeus was seeking him, even he wasn't, you know, spiritual, he was the one that God. So when you're seeking God, don't be surprised when the blessing comes. How do I know? Matthew six thirty three. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all things shall be added unto you. When you seek God first, there is a blessing that comes unto you. So you got to seek God. Not only does God seek us to build a relationship, and we must seek Him back. He sets us up for blessings. Somebody says it's a setup. It's in the text. It says that this man, the word is used, he continually came to Shunem. That meant that there were other people who could have built a house for him, other people who could have fed him, but nobody else was looking out for him. It's a setup. Some people want the blessing, but they don't want God. This woman was seeking a relationship and more God. You need more God if you're going to get to the blessing. What am I talking about? This woman... Wanted more God. So what? So all of a sudden, she built this room where she was at. And because of her building the room, God set her up for the blessing that we're going to see follow. I'm getting to in just one moment. What happened in the blessing? Think about the children of Israel. They left and they wanted the blessing of getting out of bondage and slavery in Egypt. We got that. But most of them died in the desert because they wanted the blessing but they did not want God. See, to get the blessing, God wants you to live holy. He wants you to live by faith. He wants you to uh, act like you love God. He wants you to trust Him and believe Him. The only reason they died in the wilderness is because they did not believe God. Sometimes the only reason your promise dies 
is because your faith is on more on the blessing than it is on God. Joshua and Caleb were the only ones who even saw the giants but said, we be well able. I'm telling you, there's people in here, anybody who has survived will tell you, in spite of the giants, I'm still able because of who my God is. Oh, yeah, don't miss this, don't miss this. God is telling us, how many know, if it had not been for God and my relationship with God, all the mess I was doing, one touch from God and he delivered me. It's because I realized that it's a setup. God told them the land is yours. All you got to do is be faithful. Do you know that everything you need has already been set up for you? You just got to in turn seek God as he is seeking you and want more God and not just more blessings. More God, not just more blessings. And the blessing came because of their trust. You remember the, the man at the pool of Bethesda? He was sitting there, and the only reason he had not been healed all those years, he had taken this little namby pamby attitude that nobody's there to help me. And Jesus showed up. And Jesus saw his attitude, so Jesus had to ask him a question. Jesus said, Do you want to be made whole? Here's what I believe anybody who wants to get better is going to get better. Jesus said, Look, I'm here now. But with that attitude you got, you can't get your blessing. Jesus said, do you want to be made whole? He said, yes. And from that point on, it was on. I'm getting out of this situation. I'm moving up. I'm fighting back. My attitude now, my response to life is, uh-uh, don't push me. You push me, you're getting pushed back. Because it is on. And the last way we build our relationship is understanding you have to be a giver. He decided to build Build him a room. How, how can I say this so you understand this? We have gotten so messed up in our church today, even listening to preachers right now. You love it when we say stuff like what you're going to get, but you don't understand the path to have to get there is that if you become a giver, you honor God. Because this woman honored the man of God which meant she honored the things of God, which meant she honored God. Now, in this text, God had never done anything for her. See, in our, in our new religion, we want to honor God. We say, shouldn't I praise God and bless God because of what he's done for me? Yes, but that's not the reason you should be honoring God. Come on, be realistic. You should be honoring God because he's allowing you, you, to have a relationship with him. Don't act like you don't know what I'm saying. The God of the universe, the immutable God, the God who created everything, the God who is uh, uh, untouchable, eternal, that God is saying, I'm allowing you to work for me, be in a relationship with me. That's what you should be overjoyed about, that God knows your past and still wants you. God knows your thoughts and still wants you. God knows the mess you've done and still wants you. What should make you stop? Every day you get up, it's out of everybody God could have chosen. He's allowing me to have a relationship with him. And when we know that, and we see who that is, we get blessed. We think about the God. Think about it. Angels, who are not even human, have to bow and run out of his presence. Moses, who was close to God that God called him friend, could only see his backside. I'm telling you, and this same God is allowing you and me to honor him and be a part of his life. So what I'm saying to you is that this same God is being blessed or blessing us because we have a relationship. So when you understand that God is allowing you to have a relationship with him, and when you understand that we should praise him, because we're in that relationship, not for what he does, but for who he is. What am I saying? And don't act like because you're saved, you know how to worship him. There were ten lepers that got clean. And we know the story. Only one came back. And the one that came back was the one that came back to honor him and thank him. Next we find out, not only must you keep building your relationship, you must keep believing in your reward. Text says in verse 11 that one day, um, now here, here's what you need to understand about a reward. She was minding her own business. One day, Elisha came to lay down, and it says he thought to himself, go get this Shunammite woman and bring her to me. When he brought her in, the Hazai did the talking. He didn't do the talking. 
but he said, ask her, you know, what can we do for her? And the text says, it says, uh, you've done all this for me. What can I do for you? And can we speak to the commander? He said, look, I'm Elijah. I know how to get to the king. I can speak to a commander on your behalf. And the woman said, no, you know, I'm here in my own country, meaning that I'm satisfied with what I have. That's where I got to stop. You don't understand something. Serving God, there is always a reward. One of the things that's to keep you going when things don't look right is to know that in the end, serving God pays off. I don't care who it is. You can't find a scripture in the Bible that will tell you that you can't serve God and, and a blessing won't come your way. What I'm saying is God is not a quid pro quo God. He's not a tit for tat God. He's a God that says, you can't beat me given. He said, if you keep serving me, sooner or later I'm going to deliver you. Sooner or later I'm going to bring you out. Sooner or later you are going to get a reward because you serve me. There's a benefit for serving God. And normally God says, when I give back to you, it's pressed down, shaken together, and running over. So the first thing I want to tell you is God will make the first move to bless you just because your heart is right. And so when you give to God, he said, when your heart is right, I'm going to show up and bless you. So this woman never asked for a thing. Do you realize because the woman focused on the work and not on the blessing, God blessed her because he didn't ask for it, God blessed her anyhow. And then, here's the part I love. God wants to bless you so badly, he wants to reward you so badly, that he will give you what you didn't even ask for. He will give you something that's already, that you think you can't have. He'll give you something that you think is beyond your ability. He'll give you something that you have already forgotten about. What do I mean? Gehazi said, when the woman says she didn't know what she wanted, Gehazi said, she has no son. You need to understand something. In Old Testament times, in biblical times, there are two times when people in biblical life thought they were cursed. And that is they thought they were cursed by God. That is when they had leprosy or when they were barren. And so this woman was barren. The text actually says uh, she has no son and her husband is old. Watch that. Because that means God wants to bless me enough that he'll do a miracle in order to do it. Now, we look at all the, all the miracles of Sarah and Hannah and all the, miracles, all the women that got blessed when they were barren. They were in God's will. This doesn't stand out as much as being in God's will. But did you know right there is a supernatural God saying, because you've been faithful, I'm going to bless you with what you thought was dead. She thought beyond, she said, I can't have a child now, my husband, oh. But God said, I will supernaturally bless you. Somebody out there ought to hear me. God is getting ready to shake up the natural, turn stuff over just to give you a blessing. Come on, you got to lift your hands in praise. You got to worship him and believe that God is getting ready to do something supernatural. When you lay down and think it's over, that's when God just beginning. When you lay down and said, I can't have that, God said, resurrect your dreams. Bring back your de desires. Bring back what you need and I'm going to bless you with it. What am I telling you? God said, I'm going to do a miracle. Elijah looked at her and said, by this time next year, you will have a child. She said, oh no. Don't fool me. When you first look at that, you think it's uh, unbelief, but it's not. It's like what happened to me. Uh, I just had a birthday, and I've been wanting this big screen TV for my back room. And I was told I wasn't getting it. And, you know, my wife was pulling the trick on me. And when I came in one day, I walked in, and she said, Happy birthday. And I walked in the back room, and there they were putting my TV up. And I said, For real? No, I said, I'm looking at the TV, but I said, For real? You know why we do that? Not in unbelief, but just so happy of what God is doing. It makes you say, for real? Or please, oh my God, it's beyond your madness. Won't God do something that'll make you shout and jump and say, I don't know why he even did what he did for me. God said, you got to believe in your reward. He will bless you so much that he will give you a miracle. Proverbs 19, 17 says, he that lendeth to the poor lendeth to the Lord parables and talents. If you look at Jesus, he said, because you've been faithful over a few things, I will give you, make you a blessing over many. Let's take to the last point. Not only must you keep building your relationship, not only must you keep believing for your reward. Come on, that'll make you hang in there. Believe something good is going to happen. you got to get to the last point because here's how we close. It says that you got to make sure you keep battling until you get results. The son died. He was out in the field with his father. 
He might have had a seizure. We don't know what it was, but he died. Now, I want you to watch this. The heart of this woman. And it was harvest time, the text says. So they brought the baby in. When he died, the father said, take it. To take him to his mother. I know the mother, we know the mother had supernatural faith. So he took him to his mother. She held the baby on her lap until he died. It was at that moment, here's our text, when I know she laid there for a minute and then she said, oh no, not my blessing. It's on. She laid the boy in the room she had built for Elijah. She went to her husband. Now watch the steps in saying it's on. She went to her husband because it was harvest time and all the servants were in the field. She went to her husband and asked permission. She said, I need a donkey and a servant to take me to the man of God. He said, why are you trying to go to the man of God? It's not a new moon or a harvest or a face day. He said, look, I got to get to the man of God. So she went to ask her husband something that was impossible. It was harvest time. Her husband said, I need my donkey. I need my servant. Here's the first point I want you to know about battling. You got to be, not be afraid to ask for it. The Bible says you have not because you ask. Now, think about what I just said. Some of you, the reason you don't have it, you don't ask for it until you get your back against the wall. But he said, ask for it. She was not afraid to ask. She got the donkey. And when she saddled the donkey, not only did, I don't know how, if her husband won or lost the argument, but the next verse says she was saddling the donkey. And as she was saddling the donkey, she looked at the servant, and she told the servant, now, you gotta, you got to get the picture. She was going to ride the donkey. The servant was supposed to run in front of her and leave. She said, don't you slow down unless I tell you to. Don't worry about me. second thing you do to, to get your attitude up is say, I'm not worried about comfort. Listen to me. You have to take it to make it. Don't let people fool you. Anybody victorious will tell you they have gone through pure hell. you got to take some stuff. Don't sit there and just want to be victorious and don't want to go through anything. She said, don't worry about me. Then when she got to the man of God. As she got there, Elisha saw her coming down the road, sinking his eye out. She came to her and asked her, uh, what's going on? Is everything okay? Look at the text. He said, everything's okay. I thought to myself, this woman done went the line. She's in the middle of the biggest fight in her life, and she said everything is okay. But what I found out was the reason she could say everything was okay is because in, in the Spirit of God, just kind of birthed this in me. It is okay. She had turned it over to God. She was on her mission. So even if you're in the middle of it, if you gave it to God, don't start speaking negative when you already told God you believe Him. She said, it's okay. Right in the middle of it. Watch the text. That was her perspective. My boy's dead, but everything's okay because I'm with the man of God, and I turned it over to God. And then finally, God, Elias said, I thought he did well. He told Gehazi, take my staff, which is a symbol of his power. Gird up your loins. I mean, because men used to wear the long skirts. Tuck the skirt in so you can run. Run. If somebody comes along, don't give them a greeting. If they greet you, don't talk back. He said, run and lay my staff on his board. He looked at the woman, and the woman said, as God lives, I am not leaving here unless you go with me. Not only must you press this, you must not accept a substitute. Don't accept a substitute. She decided, I'm not going. So the Hazar went, but Elisha had to follow her. And Elisha followed her down the road. And as she got down the road, the Hazar came out and said it didn't work. See, this woman had a faith connection with God. She wouldn't accept it. And then she said, I'm getting ready to battle Elisha. I'm going to battle my husband. I'm going to battle the elements. I'm going to battle death. I'm going to battle everything because it's on till I get some results. And the end of the story is Elisha went there, up in the room, laid across his body. Boy still wasn't breathing. Laid there again. Some people said, Elisha was just, you know, trying to figure out what was going on. No, he was a protege of Elijah. I believe he, re- he was taught by Elijah because Elijah had raised up a young man. And he laid across the boy, and then the heat from his body went into the boy, but the boy still wasn't raised up. And I like when the text says, Elijah said, something's wrong with this boy, but God hasn't told me. Do you know? God, he said, God hasn't told me. Elijah was saying, God always tells me. Even Elijah said, a great man of God had to walk by faith. And, of course, the boy raised up. And you know who was outside that door waiting? The Shunammite woman. And the Bible said, she said, come get your son. I'm done. Wow. 
a lot in that text, but you got to hear something. Come get your son. Keep building your relationship, good or bad. Keep working. Keep on believing for your reward. It's coming. Hang in there. You're going to bless God. And thirdly, battle until you get the results that you know God can give you. Oh, no. It's on. You got it? This week when the enemy attacks you and tells you you're done, say, "Uh uh-uh, it's on. I changed my response. Nothing in this world is going to keep me down as long as I can say, oh, no, it's on. Bow your head with me today. Father God, I thank you for everyone who heard this message and those who are going to share this message and pass it on. Because somebody needs to hear that, that, that new response, that change of heart, that change of attitude, that, that excitement that this woman had. Please pass that on. And just in case you're not saved today, say these words with me. Lord God, I need you in my life. You already know me. I believe you died. And I confess it now. And I am saved. If you pray that prayer, go into the Bible, read the scripture. Gospel of John will help you. Call us up. Go to www.skylobaptistchurches and get a blessing. You can become a virtual member or you can just ask us to send you something to affirm your new life. This is Pastor Duncan saying, have a great Sunday. And remember, I don't know what's going to happen to you this week, but as soon as it does, say, "Uh uh-uh. Oh, no. It is on. God bless you. Take it to him and leave it there. I was down with a no way up and I needed some help. Everybody breathing but not living, just existing. Well, and I needed some help. Somebody told me that Jesus will set you free I tried it for myself and now I know what he did